Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm really happy to be here because um, I know a lot of you from the PZR and from the PZD, and um, whether patients come in for because of a rash or whether it's a skin manifestation of a systemic disease or it's just an, oh, by the way, look at this rash, um, I think that we see a lot of patients. And um, thinking of you out there in the adults' world and with no pediatrician around and Hopefully, this really will help you get through. Most of the things that I'm showing you are things that we see a lot and things that I really think you should be familiar with. Um, so that being said, there's always more and more rashes. Um, this is your worst nightmare. It's a five-day-old with a generalized rash and an anxious nurse, an anxious mother, and now what do I do? Um, I would like if anyone thinks they know any of these to rush it to you know speak up, but this is an otherwise healthy five day old. The rash started day three of life when, on the way home from the hospital and has gotten much worse. It was a normal delivery, full term infant, no complications. And the mother is very anxious. They want to change the formula, they want cream, they want antibiotics, they want it all. What anyone have an idea? So neonatal acne is usually on the face, a good thought, but this is just in light because I have a lot of lectures, I mean I have a lot of pictures. This is, um, anyone else, erythema toxicum, which is the most common rash that you'll see in a newborn. And it is, the etiology is not totally clear, but it's believed to be from immature pilosebaceous glands and usually starts the first week of life, usually day two, day three, and resolves by day seven. It is totally benign. It is often referred to as flea-bite dermatosis because that's what it kind of looks like. There are papules or pustules on an erythematous face, usually on the chest, the back, very generalized, and very impressive, very scary, totally benign, no medicine, reassurance. I leave you this picture because just to remind you, everybody recognizes those blankets. It's usually the first rash that infants will present with. It usually happens as they're leaving the hospital. And by the way, there is one company in the whole country that makes all those blankets. It's an American-made company that we should have done that um, since the 50s. You'll see every newborn with that blanket in the hospital. But anyway, that's just to remind you it's early in the neonatal period. And then you see this rash, another baby, and this is a five-day-old also, comes in with a little rash on the scalp. Mom's been putting on a little bacitracin, um, normal delivery, no complications, had a scalp monitor. So mom and the grandmother think it may be just a rash from the uh, scalp monitor. Any ideas? This is the one you don't want to miss. This is neonatal herpes. So although the other rash was a lot more impressive, that one's benign, this one is not. Remember, neonatal herpes presents in three ways, um, either SEM, which is skin, eye, mouth, CNS herpes, or disseminated herpes. But skin, eye, and mouth can very rapidly progress to, neuro, to um, uh, CNS herpes or disseminated herpes. So this you have to be very, very vigilant about. This is a child who needs you know, acute intervention. But remember, 90% 90% of neonatal herpes is uh, perinatally acquired. 10% is prenatally acquired, intrauterine, but rare. And 10% is about postnatally acquired. Um, either someone has a herpes simplex on their lip and transmits it. But neonatal herpes has a very high morbidity and mortality, and those infants who have it usually have really bad sequelae. So this is one you never want to miss. Remember, herpes is group vesicles on an erythematous face, and often presents on the presenting part, and often uh, the mothers have no risk factors or no known history of HSV, because the, the ones that have known HSV, they're on Valtrex suppression. Those are the ones we don't miss, but it's those who shed the virus we don't even know about. So always be very, very aggressive. That's why any FIB under the 29 days of age is automatically treated with IBA cyclovir, um, regardless of whether we know it's herpes or not, just because the sequelae is so bad. And those with CNS herpes, and I just have to throw this in, uh, with CNS or disseminated herpes present with sepsis. 
but some present with skin, eye, and mouth. So just be really vigilant if you see that. I have seen babies whose uh, scalps were uh, recognized and thought to be septurum and miss. So we just never want to miss herpes. And that's herpes too. It's group vesicles on an erythematous face. So here's your next nightmare. It's a 10 month old with, uh, who's been seen for several days with fever, actually presented with a febrile seizure, sent home, and now comes in with this generalized macropapular eruption. Anyone? No, but that's a really good thought. That's a really good thought. Anyone? Roseola, yes. So roseola is the most common viral exanthem of infancy. Typically, they present about 7 to 13 months. And it's all about the history, fever, 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 no source. And then the fever resolves, and they have this generalized macropapular eruption in a well-appearing infant. So while the rash is impressive, it is a self-limiting. It's, it's usually human herpes virus 6, and these kids do well. Just a note, this is why you don't want to treat kids with amoxicillin if you're hedging on their ears. And someone along the way got nervous because this is the second visit and they have a fever of 104 and maybe the ears look red, so I'm going to treat them with amoxicillin. And then all along it was actually roseola, but they break out in this rash and someone diagnoses um, drug rash and now they've been labeled penallergic their whole life when it was actually roseola. During the time that they have the uh, pre-exam time, there's nothing on physical. So they have maybe a little shoddy occipital node. They may have a little runny nose. But they basically have a normal exam. And then after the fever defervesce, they break out in the rash. And this is it. And the, the measles was a good thought because it is a more biliform generalized macrocapular eruption, typically on the face, neck, chest, and back. So this is probably the most common chronic disease in children after asthma. Anyone? Eczema, right. So just a few clues because eczema can mimic other things. Um, it usually presents around two months of age, not neonatal, but early infancy. Um, one little clue is they, it is not infected, they just get erythematous plaques. The distribution in infants is different than children and adults. In infants, it's typically on their face, their chest, and their extensor surfaces, whereas when we, children are usually on their flexor surfaces, so their antecubital, their popliteal, and adults often have it on their hands and feet. So the distribution is different. And there's something that's always a clue. It's called the headlight sign. Even as bad as this infant's face is, you see there's a real clearing over the nasal area, the philtrum, the nasal bridge. It's usually perfectly clear. And the other area that's usually perfectly clear on a kid who can have horrendous atopic dermatitis, anyone want to guess? The diaper area. It's believed that the moisture of the diaper is sort of a permanent moisturizer to their skin. So um, they're usually their diaper area is clear and their headlight sign is clear, even when it's very generalized. And here you see the same thing, no matter how bad it is. And just one thing about atopic direct. Um, dermatitis, the pruritus is sort of the hallmark of the disease. So kids are miserable. They don't sleep. They rub against the sheets. So we really need to treat this well. I think even pediatricians are not good at treating it. Um, and this is it. It can be quite extensive. And I'll go over treating it in a minute. But anyone want to, is this atopic dermatitis? No, it looks a little different. Any ideas? Yeah, so this is septurm, and the easiest way to remember this is it looks like potato chips, and it really does. Usually, it presents earlier than atopic dermatitis, and usually there's scalp involvement. So usually, you'll see what, what is known as cradle cap, and then it extends to their face. They actually often can have diaper involvement. So this is thought to be associated with yeast, and it's treated with antifungal cream if you need to treat, as opposed to atopia, which you treat with topical steroids. So um, you can treat this a little with topical steroids, but the antifungals usually work better. Um, often, if you clear their scalp alone, then their skin will improve. And treating the scalp is just shampooing and you know leaving Vaseline on and combing it. So people are afraid to touch top. Fontanelles, as you all know, so there's usually a big wad right over the fontanelle. 
Um, this is typically how you see it in the older kids, as you know. And just and this is lichenification, and this is just from chronic scratching and rubbing, and nobody should have that. And the reason they have that is because we haven't treated well enough. So just a few little highlights on treating. Don't be afraid to use steroids. You really only need to know three, cat, three steroids. I know there's this huge chart. All my career, I've really basically used three. One percent patients have already used, and it's not working, or they wouldn't have come. It's basically a mommy cream. It does almost nothing. So for you need a low, a medium, and a high potency. A low potency, I use to start with two and a half percent hydrocortisone cream. A medium potency, this is easy to remember, is mametasone cream, which is Elecon. And if you change the vehicle from cream to ointment, you change the potency. So so uh, Elecon, well, I use it interchangeably. Elecon cream is medium potency. Elecon ointment is high potency. So two and a half percent hydrocortisone, Elecon cream, and then Elecon ointment. If you have your favorites, that's fine. I just like to keep things easy. But the biggest problem is usually you use too low potency a steroid. The 1% hydrocortisone is the only time I use that is on infants when you have to really use it and it's pretty generalized for it, but there are other low potency options that work a little better like desinide. But treat them, and there's a three-minute rule. Just this is really important. This is for adults too. They should. They sh in the old days they used to tell patients with atopia not to bathe, but they actually should bathe. And bath bath should be short, three minutes. And within three minutes of getting out of the shower or tub, they should apply both the topical steroids and the lubricant when the skin is is um, still moist. And really and truly, the true key is moisturizing their skin. Remember, lotions, basically you very rarely should use a lotion. There's a lot of water, and it evaporates, it dries the skin more. So you should always either use a cream or an ointment. An ointment has no water in it, so it works better. Patients don't like the greasiness sometimes, but you're always better off with an ointment like Aquaphor. Um, and sometimes CeraVe, which is ceramides, uh, patients do really well. This is numular eczema. And it, numular means coin-like. You see it a lot on the extremities. It's not infection. It's not in patigo. It's, it's, it's just a form of eczema. This, once again, is numular eczema. And what does it look like? It looks like ringworm, but you see it's more of a plaque rather than raised border central clearing. And if you look around the skin around it, you can say it looks eczematous. You wouldn't have all those lesions if it was ringworm. Ringworm looks like that. Very similar, raised board or central clearing. You don't even need to know this because the parents, this is the one rash they know. My child has ringworm. If they say they have ringworm, they usually do. And just topical antifungal slotrimin is fine and usually works. Just one word about this. Um, we pride ourselves in not overusing antibiotics. But this is the one thing um, with patients with atopic disease. They colonize staph. They colonize staph more than most people because their skin is always broken down. So very often it doesn't look classically impetigenized, but staph is an antigen, so it makes their otopia worse. So often when they have a flare, if you give them a short course of Keflex, it actually, as long as well as increasing the potency of their steroids, they do better. So just it's one of the few times I have a low threshold to use um, oral antibiotics. Sure. So impetigo is caused by group A strep or staph. So you have to cover with both. Actually, originally it was more staph, and then in the 50s and 60s was more prominently strep, but now impetigo is more staph. But you do not know, so you cover for both. Thank you. Sure. This, every, anyone knows what it is? Annoying, itchy. Yeah, contact. This is nickel dermatitis. Nickel is in everything. Unless it's gold and silver, every single piece of metal you're wearing or touching has nickel because it's a cheap filler, and it's a real allergen. So um, where you see nickel, you often get dermatitis. And the, all these patients with it around their abdomen like this, this is nickel dermatitis. It's the, bulk, the uh, buckle that, that causes it. So you, nobody likes to wear elastic, obviously, <laughs> but uh, elastic pants, that's a no-no. But um, the, the buckle will always cause that. Um, you can paint it with clear nail polish. You can wear a shirt under it. There's ways around it. But that is very commonplace that you'll see contact dermatitis. 
Anyone for this one? This is poison ivy. And, you know, one thing I can say is I've probably looked at, I've been working in the PZF for 30 years, believe it or not. But I look, I've probably looked at every single solitary rash that I, when I've been working because I've always been interested in, I will tell you that every rash looks different even when it's the same disease. And poison ivy is one that stumbles people a lot. But it is a contact dermatitis. It is not what you read about or learned about in medical school. It's much more variable. But it's an inflammatory dermatitis. It's very itchy. I call it the calamine sign. Almost always patients will walk in covered in calamine because it's so itchy. Um, but it can be vesicles. It can be full eye. It can be streaks. This is what you saw in medical school. I've never actually seen anyone's poison ivy like that. It just doesn't look like that. It looks more like that, sort of just scattered. Remember um, a couple of things on poison ivy. Patients, if it comes out several hours after you've had it, and it comes out over several days, so people think they are getting exposed and exposed. But it's the thickness of the skin and the amount of exposure that uh, will tell how soon it comes out. So typically first comes out on the face and when poison ivy is on the face it pre often presents with edema and, and erythema rather than the classic um, poison ivy. So they often present with very swollen eyes. So think, think poison ivy, don't forget about it. It's not orbital cellulitis, periorbital, preceptal, any of those, it's usually poison ivy. And this, if you look down by his chin you can see one little crusted plaque, but otherwise presents with the demon erythema, and this is very classic. One little pearl is always look at the genitals, because very often in boys, they auto-inoculate themselves. So very often, because they're going to the bathroom, they have lesions around their genitals as well. Um, but a couple of pearls, important when you're treating poison ivy. Um, does anyone know the indications for treating orally? with steroids, we know topical steroids will treat them, and you have to treat them with potent steroids, and you have to treat them early in the course. But there are, so are some indications for when you would give oral steroids. Right, so face, genitals, and or pretty extensive. But the most important thing that you need to remember about topical steroids is you must taper. If you give a short course like a pred pack, which I know you guys use for other things, you will get a rebound at the end. So do not give five days of steroids. If they have a very good chance at five days, it'll rebound and come back worse than it ever came. So it's one of the few times we actually impede taper steroids. Um, so it usually works out to be about two, two weeks or two weeks plus. There's no magic to tapering steroids. Um, no science of exactness. Usually start with one, to, one per kilo max at 60 or per day on day one. Um, but so tapering, there's no exact science, but if you really start with, say you start with 60 and you cut down, it usually goes at least two weeks, two weeks or a little more, just because there's no way to taper in less time. So three days, three days, three days, three days. Um, but there's no exact science over exactly how to taper steroids. And this is poison ivy. And you see significant edema, especially on the face and the genital. Leaves of three, stay away from the, you'll remember that, but remember it changes with the seasons. In this part of the country, we have mostly poison ivy. Poison sumac is in the south, for those of you who are, and who are going west, it's poison oak. Um, but uh, it is single-handedly the one plant that causes more hypersensitivity reaction than all other plants put together. And 50 to 75% of all patients are sensitive to the resin on the plant. So it's very, very common. So if it's on the face, you said you just treat? If, you know, if you saw one little scratch, but if it's on the face, genitals, or extensive, you consider um, oral steroids. Anywhere else, you would, you, if you use topical steroids early, it will help a lot, but you have to go potent. Once you have a bullous formation or it's really extensive, the topical steroids aren't going to work. The normal course of, of poison ivy is about three weeks. So if you do nothing, it lasts about three weeks. The patients are really miserable. And actually, there is a role for calamine lotion. That's what, the only time you actually need calamine lotion because it actually dries it up. And it's not antihistamines, or actually people give antihistamines because they're itchy, but it's not a histamine release. So antihistamines don't actually help. The only help they do is sedation, so people sleep for that better. 
So I would use a sedating antihistamine like Benadryl as opposed to like Zyrtec. And you use your ointment then? So you use ibuprofen? Yes, I would use a, I would use an ointment. All right, for a short course. Don't use, give them too big a bottle of an ointment because the, actually ointment is effective. So patients love, love, love ointment because it works better and it has the benefit of having an ointment as well. So you do, do not want them to use it for too long and of course avoid the genitals and face and the axilla. One of the EM patients in me had this patient or EM patient had this patient and I was with them. Anyone have, know what this is? I can't remember who it was, but anyone want to guess what this is? This has been going on for several weeks. They've gone to many different places, treated with impetigo, scabies, right? I just want to say that because scabies in babies is different than scabies in adults. It's much more inflammatory, much more pustular. It's different. And scabies in babies is common because the two ways you transmit scabies most commonly are sexual contact, close bed contact and mother to infant. So um, it, we see it a lot in infancy and it gets missed. It gets missed till it gets really bad and then it's obvious, but it is much more inflammatory, much more pustular in infants and, scape, and babies get it on their head as opposed to adults, which you never usually see from the neck down. But the burrows that you see are uncommon. It's another one of those things that you learn, but don't you don't have to see burrows to know it's scabies. It's just an added help. But that's scabies. Scabies in the beginning, the rash is disproportionate to the itching. So they might have this little rash, but they'll tell you the itching is driving me crazy. I'm so, so itchy. So if anything is ever super, super itchy, always have a, you know, have that in the back of your mind. But it starts as very nondescript papules. So here you see a burrow because it's on the wrist. But a lot of times this is scabies, and you'll see their skin is really red and excoriated despite the fact that the rash looks like absolutely nothing. But when you are looking for the um, burrows, they tend to burrow only on the hands and wrists, and the rest is where you get the rash. So you may see it other places, but commonly you won't. And this is it. So just be very, very suspicious. All right, this is a diaper rash. Mom's been playing cornstarch, baby, um, desidin, everything and it's not going away and, and the baby's crying because it hurts anybody so strep is always a good guess this is candida all right candida diaper dermatitis any dermatitis that is there for more than three or four days will have overgrowth of candida and the easy way that you can remember this i hope is it's fire engine red it's redder than any other diaper rash, it's very well marginated, and you see satellite lesions in the periphery. Um, you do want to treat this. There's, it's very benign to treat its lotrimin. If you're thinking candida, it's probably candida. And you can get perirectal involvement. And as you see, it's the same thing. It's very well marginated. It's fire engine red, and you see satellite lesions. Same here. So it always will look different, but the same similar characteristics come out. OK, anyone for this one? That's impetigo, yay, yes. Common around the mouth, common in young children, two to five, six years old. This is classic impetigo with the honey crusted cover for group A strep and staph. Not commonly MSSA, MRSA, it's usually MSSA. So what would you treat with? Keflex is great, Augmentum, but Keflex is even better, less GI, cheaper better and you can if you if it was just one small area you can treat topically with what Bactroban, Bactroban. not bacitrase and not neosporin Bactroban right but once you get more than a bunch of lesions or nose mouth you need oral and this is typically how it starts but and some people say is that herpes but herpes wouldn't give you so many lesions remember there's probably one on the arm and leg they auto inoculate themselves but typically starts around the mouth and nose. This is bullous impetigo, which you don't treat any differently. It's a little more commonly staph, but the lesions themselves are not the classic. Honey crested, they're more bullous, and then they, the roof sort of falls off and they dry out and crust. But think impetigo, and they need to be treated for seven to 10 days. Anybody? Something new? Impetigo, not? 
herpes, yes. Anyway, herpes is ubiquitous, anywhere, everywhere, group vesicles on an erythematous space. Remember, this is the vesicles, the, the roof is very fragile, so that, that part does not last long that they have vesicles. So um, it doesn't look like that for very long. By the time you see them, the vesicles are probably gone and it's a little crusted over. Remember, it's usually right at the vermilion border. The latest recommendations for adults, if you catch it early, are two grams Q12 of Valtrex, Q12 hours times one dose, times one day. So two grams in the morning, two grams 12 hours later, and that's the treatment if you treat it early in the disease. The bioavailability of Valtrex is so great. Um, I predate to acyclovir, and Valtrex just works so much better. Um, it is not recommended routinely under the age of 12, so often we give acyclovir, but the dosing is much more inconvenient. Um, Valtrex is Q day, a B, or usually BID. And that is, anyone? Herpetic Whitlow. Yeah, we see this a lot. Ask if they're thumb suckers or nail biters. They probably are, and that's how they auto inoculated themselves. Kids have been admitted for cellulitis. Abscesses don't drain herpetic Whitlow. It prolongs the, it's tempting. I know you guys love pus, but don't drain herpetic Whitlow. It prolongs the healing and um, uh, actually makes it spread worse, and it's just a no-no. So think um, herpetic Whitlow here. This is very common. This is what it looks like, and that's a paronychia. So you kind of see the difference. It's not really exactly around the nail usually, but it can be, but it's group vesicles that become pustules. And ask them if they've ever had it before in the same place. Anyone? This is a febrile baby, he's 103, very cranky. This rash started two days ago and way worse. Anyone? This is something we actually see a lot. This is eczema herpeticum, and this is eczema secondarily infected with herpes. And this, you can see in immunosuppressed adults, we see it more in children, and eczema is a predisposing factor, and it is eczema that is secondarily infected with HSV. There is morbidity and mortality, and you know they can see the herpes, so they're usually admitted for IBI cycle there. This, of course, you would admit because it's so close to the eye and you don't want to get keratitis. Um, although the, con the sclera looks white, the conjunctiva doesn't look injected, but you worry because it's so close to the eye. They're often secondarily infected with staph or strep as well. And this is eczema herpeticum. And you can see they're sort of punched out and they crust over. If it's really localized in an older person, we don't always admit, but infants always. And this is eczema herpeticum. And you see it's just they're punched out, they're confluent, not like impetigo that's sort of out in the satellite. This is eczema herpeticum. But important to recognize, often gets missed as impetigo and not getting better with Keflex or Augment, and, and the reason being because it's herpes. Their herpes loves lymph nodes, lymph nodes no, love herpes, so when you think it's herpes, there's very often a reactive node nearby. How about this? This is a butt back and buttocks. Do you come in just because they want to know what the rash is? They're not sick. This rash has been there for five days. The mom wants to know what it is. Hmm? And, okay. No, this is shingles. So we do see shingles in the kids, but I want to tell you how it presents differently. See the dermatone, see how it doesn't cross the midline. Um, shingles in kids is much more benign, meaning they present with what's the rash. They don't have, they're not preceded by the terrible pain. They don't have the neuralgias. Um, they just come in for the rash. And kids who are at risk for varicella are kids who have chickenpox at a young age. So typically they had varicella under a year before they've been vaccinated. Um, so they present with the rash, not the sequelae. And this, once again, we, you can also see it in um, uh, vaccinated kids as well. We see it about once a month in the PED. We definitely see shingles. And that shingles, once again, but remember, it doesn't cross the midline. It's one to two adjacent dermatomes usually. Anyone? Here's the one you don't want to miss. This is chickenpox. 
All right, and you, I used to see chicken pox all the time, all the time, but you don't see, you see it infrequently, but you still see chicken pox. Everyone under a year is not vaccinated. We have a lot of immigrants and pe there are failed vaccines. You don't want to be the one who has this kid in the waiting room and infects the whole waiting room and all the hemoc patients. You want to be able to recognize varicella. <laughs> it's a big deal if you miss varicella. So the children generally do well. Um, and But remember, what's the hallmark of varicella? That you know it's varicella. Right, so they're lesions at different stages. They will not be all vesicles. They will not all be papules. They will not all be crusted over. They're lesions at different stages. They're contagious one day before the rash breaks out until they're all crusted over. So consider them. It is incredibly contagious and airborne, um, but it starts on the head and the face and, and the distribution. There was a kid maybe two weeks ago in the in the uh, in the PZR with chickenpox and Sarah, someone said, Sarah, can you look at that rash? And I said, it's Varicella and Dr. Hafiz and someone else who's seen a lot, they said, oh my God, I didn't even think of that. Like, I know you do, it's not on your radar, but don't forget about chickenpox. We absolutely see chickenpox and it's really for public health reasons that it's so important that you isolate these kids. Um, we used to see them, so many of them, that we would go, we would not even bring them into ER, we would see them in the ambulance bay. We would bring an otoscope out there, a stethoscope, examine them, write their prescriptions in those days, and send them on their way so they didn't bring this infectious airborne disease into the ER. But we had the privilege of knowing what varicella looks like. But just be suspicious, it starts as a tiny little vesicle. Even one vesicle until proven otherwise is the beginning of ch chicken pox. The dew drop, and, but this vesicular stage is very short. It will dry up, crest over. And this is varicella in an adult. It's not acne, it's not in petigo, it is varicella. Anyone for this one? Same as this one. Yay, very good, very good. We had a case of measles about four months ago. You do, even more important than another public health thing you do not want to miss is measles. And um, uh, we, every measles, the first vaccine is at 12 months. And in 1989, there was a very big measles epidemic. And on, in vaccinated children, that, that's when they realize that one vaccine isn't enough. So they get their second MMR at four to six years. So, and yes, we have a lot of immigrants and there is measles, but measles is so airborne that 90% of people who are exposed will get, if they're uh, susceptible, will get the disease and it is transmitted in public places, you do not need direct contact. So this is another one, if you're thinking measles, do not let them go in the waiting room, isolate them if there's, and then you can decide whether, you know, they just got ahead for, you were nervous or whatever, but remember the three C's, that's all you need to remember. Say them. Conjunctivitis. And kids with measles look sick, unlike the kid with roseola who looks totally well. When you have measles, you get the rash at the height of the fever. So those kids are 104, 105. You, it is a febrile illness, and you have the cough, coryza, and conjunctivitis at the time of the rash. So there's a prodome. They're infectious four days before till after, but you don't, you don't have the pleasure of seeing it. But once they break out in a more biliform rash, and that's what that means, measles like, it's a macropapular eruption, cephalocaudal, always starts on the head and works its way down. And that's measles also. And if you remember the complex spots, you remember that from medical school, they're opposite your second molar. They look like grains of stands. Um, those you see before the rash, so you're probably not gonna see them. They appear 24 to 48 hours before they break out the rash. So during the measles epidemic, it was helpful because you, if you saw complex spots, you could say they're, prob they're gonna have the measles, but unlikely that you're going to see them so don't count on them. Okay, this is common, common, common. Anyone has seen this? Any ideas? This is primary herpetic gingiva stomatitis, right? This is not Coxsackie. There's gingiva involvement. There's stoma involvement. It's a primary herpes infection. Very, very common miserable, the normal course of herpes is about two weeks and causes tongue bleeding and won't drink and fever and misery. And if you treat it really early, if you see it really early in the illness, they there is some uh, 
literature on treating with POA cyclovir and to maybe shorten the course and lessen the illness. These kids probably will come to the ER three times during the course of the illness, so you should know it. Um, anyone seen that yet? I promise you will. I promise. Um, POA cyclovir. They're usually it's a primary HSV infection, so they're usually younger kids. You can see it in older kids. You can see it in adults, but most people have had it as a younger child. But it's gingiva stomatitis, very friable. When you put their you tongue depressor or look in their mouth, you'll be it will have blood on it. Their gums are really friable and inflamed. In adults, you will use like magic mouthwash and stuff, but I know in kids you usually avoid. Yeah, we avoid the lidocaine, and they're usually miserable and ornery toddlers, so you try giving magic mouthwash. We give it to the mothers and tell them if they can pat it, but usually Motrin, Motrin and fluids through a straw, you know, or a syringe to make them drink. It's all about hydration. That's really what it's about and comfort. Anyone seen this? A very fine rash. I'm sure I, if they were in the PCR, I would have shown some of you. Anyone? Scarlet fever, right. Remember scarlet fever. It's a uh, reaction to the endotoxin of group A strep. Um, you may or may not see it with strep. So I know you have the Cantor criteria in adults for who you culture. We have a much lower threshold. Um, but it makes diagnosing strep throat much easier for all of you. You may, may or may not have a sore throat. They may present with just the rash. They may present with abdominal pain and headache, but have a low threshold we're treating to prevent, obviously, the rare complication of rheumatic fever. Patients, anyone on this, the desquamation of the fingers? Post-strep, yeah, so you see it after strep. So the patients might present with just the desquamation. Chances are they just had strep or culture them for strep or sometimes we would even just treat them for strep. Remember, you're gonna clear strep in two or three days, um, but you have a window of 10 to 14 days, really 10 days that you wanna treat them in. And that's the classic strawberry tongue that you will see with scarlet fever, but not every patient reads all the textbooks, unfortunately. But one thing you see with um, strawberry tongue is um, perioral uh, blanching sort of pallor right around their lips. When else do you see strawberry tongue in kids? Good, I knew you'd know that. Right. All right, anyone um, uh, know what this is? Molluscum, good. Remember, this is magnified. It's umbilicated, very common. Typically, you don't treat. Treating, warts have a mind. It's the pox virus. Warts have a mind of their own. You can treat them, and they won't go away. You cannot treat them. They will go away. Most will totally resolve by a year. Sometimes they persist. If some, molluscum is considered a sexually transmitted disease because it's from close contact with sex, so you will see it in adults. It's benign. Um, if you see someone covered in molluscum, or like way too many molluscum think HIV or immunosuppressive disease. But typically with kids, it's on their face. It can be on their buttocks. It does not mean they were sexually transmitted. It's usually auto-inoculated. Um, and usually other kids in the family have it. But in adults, when they transmit it, it's sexually transmitted. But sometimes you almost need a magnifying a glass. Um, uh, they're so tiny, but you look for the umbilication. You all know this. If you spent any time in the PCR, Coxsackie, right. The most common, um, commonly recognized viral exanthem. So people know what this is. But that being said, this is herpangina, which is when Coxsackie presents just with lesions in the oral pharynx. Remember, you can have hand, foot, you can have hand, foot, mouth, or this is herpangina, which has nothing to do with herpes. Um, Coxsackie is an enterovirus it presents with lesions in the posterior palate. That's, and people get that wrong all the time. Anyone know what this is? This is atypical Coxsackie. And you need to know this because it's now being seen in adults as well. So Coxsackie is A6, A16. And atypical Coxsackie was just seen in 2008 in Japan and then came to the United States in 2011. And so it's a different strain of Coxsackie, and therefore, we don't see Coxsackie in adults because most of us had it as a child and are immune, but this strain, they don't have immunity, so you will see it in older kids, and the, and the disease looks a little different. You will still have the hands and foot, but you'll have much more cutaneous involvement, and it can be cute, um, vesicular and bolus, bolus-lucking, 
and there's something called eczema coxsackium, so kids with eczema have it predisposed in areas where they have eczema. But um, we see this a lot, a lot, and people don't know what it is. It's misdiagnosed as eczema herpeticum or impetigo, but this is atypical coxsackie. Um, and it should often be called hand, foot, and mouth butt disease because particularly um, this strain you see a lot on the genital, especially on the buttocks. And you see more perioral involvement, see the top slide, as opposed to intraoral involvement of traditional Coxsackie. And it's benign, it's self-limiting, most kids do very well with Coxsackie. This is a kid, an older, you can see he's older, he was like 14. We see a lot of this. We see a lot of Coxsackie and we see a lot of atypical Coxsackie. Um, and this is one of the registrars from the PCR. He had it even. And this is one of the doctor's kids, uh, one of the fellow's kids who had it. But look at it. It's more on the sense of it covers about 10% of their uh, skin. So there's much more cutaneous involvement. It's vesicular. It's bullous even. And um, it's on extensive surface, buttock, and more around the mouth, but also on the hands and feet. And it's an interesting virus because it causes desquamation three weeks later. So sometimes your people, patients come in for this and ask them, did they have Coxsackie a month ago? Atypical Coxsackie causes palm and sole desquamation. And the other thing that causes this is, anyone knows this, the nails are falling off. This is onchomedesis. And it was first recognized with typhoid fever after people had typhoid fever, but is also seen after sepsis, burns, that people have an interruption of the nail matrix. So the nail matrix actually separates and their nails start falling off. It's totally benign, but happens, it's been recognized a lot after this virus. Kind of like telogen effluvium, do you know what that is? When people's hair fall out after a major stressful event, um, but it's benign and self-limiting. So patients have hair falling out, make sure, I'm, I'm serious, it happens, that happens to adults. It's after sepsis, after treatment. Did your hair fall out, Dr. Singh, did your hair fall out? <laughs> Is that what you're pointing to? <laughs> um, but anyway, oncomedesis happens after that. Okay, well, oh, I have to hurry up. What is your diagnosis on this? this who knows Chris Cavaniero? Okay, you all know him. This, uh, actually, the next one was one of his patients. So this was a girl who had a rash. And it was getting worse and worse. Mom was putting, went to a PCP, gave her 1% hard to cortisone, then they increased it and was on West Court. It's just getting worse and worse. This you won't know, but I just love it. And this is the same thing. And it's sort of florid, inflammatory, was small and getting worse. And this is Chris Cavaniero's patient. And this is called tinea incognito. And people think I made that up, but I really actually didn't. Um, it, and it's tinea that gets changed due to, in, to treatment with topical steroids. So you never want to get fungus and inflammatory mixed up, and you don't want to treat fungus with a topical steroid. There is no use for those combined drugs that are half steroid, and I don't know what it is, so I'll give a little antifungal and I'll give a little uh, steroid. There is no place for that. It's either fungal or inflammatory. But if this was Chris Cavanier's patient, and I cultured it just to prove my point, and she grew out trichophyton. But she had ringworm, and they kept applying topical steroids, and they just get worse and worse. So tinea incognito, love it. Anyway, that's tinea incognito. No, but this kept getting worse, and she kept going back, and I wouldn't. I mean, you can use 1%, sometimes 2.5%. Yeah, special. After that, derm should really do it. But Stick to 1% on the face, sometimes 2.5% if it's really um, bad. But that's tinea that got worse. All right, this I just put in for fun. This is called erythema ab igne, and I've gotten, actually never seen it, but I want to see it. But this is called laptop dermatitis. And as I was reviewing this lecture last night, my laptop was on my knees, which... <laughs> Not a good idea for many reasons, but this is a sort of reticulated rash on the thighs, just to keep in mind from uh, frequent use of the laptop. And it usually are asymptomatic, but they have some burning sensation, and they can get some hyperpigmentation afterwards. But more importantly, never good to have electronics touching your body anyway. Um, it's been associated, there's some question about with squamous cell carcinoma and spermatogenesis. So never a good time, never a good to put your laptop on your lap. 
although they try, and that's another picture of it, and that's another picture. But just to think about, it's very reticulated, macular. Anyone, you got to get this. Tinea capitis, just a couple of things. You know this has to be treated orally. It has to be treated orally with greasiofulvin for six to eight weeks. All right, no, Selsum Blue will sh any or any antifungal shampoo will uh, prevent shedding, but does not um, treat, you must treat orally. First line is greasiofulvin for kids. As I said, I know you guys love abscesses, so you are dying to drain this, but anyone know what this is? Do you remember? Carry on, very good, very good. So this is an inflammatory response to the tinea. It is treated the same way tinea is treated, and do not IND this, all right? It just feels a little different. It's not quite as fluctuant, it's a little harder, but this is an inflammatory response we see in tinea. Gotta know this one. Bed bugs. Right, the resurgence of bed bugs. So bed bugs and scabies shouldn't get confused because they present very differently. But people wake up. Don't forget they're nocturnal biters. People wake up with the bites. Often they were sleeping somewhere different, and they look like just big mosquito bites. Right? They just look like big mosquito bites, and they're typically on exposed areas. So ask them what they slept on. If they slept in little shorts, they'll probably have them on their legs. If they slept them on a t-shirt, they typically don't go under. The clothes, and here's it. They just look like big, inflamed, itchy. Um, that's what you don't want to bring home. Um, anyway, but remember, they are visible. Unlike scabies that are microscopic, tell patients to look and see if they see any evidence um, of bed bugs. But they're tiny. But you sometimes see the bug itself, or you can see like excrement from the bug. But they should look. I'm gonna end, I think, with this. Um, what do you think? Oh, here, here's another one. So there's a bug bite at the center, and then you see that. Hmm? Oh, you medical, you all go, that's why it's fun to be a nurse practitioner. You don't get off on these weird tangents. <laughs> Very practical. Um, anybody? So this is non-infectious lymphangitis associated with an arthropod bite. So you see that we see this. I promise you, everything I, I'm showing you today, I see a lot, so you will see. But see, you'll say, oh my gosh, it's streaking, right? This We need to treat with antibiotics, but it's a non-infectious lymphangiasis. There's good articles on it associated with an arthropod bite. And it would be tender, right? It would be If that was lymphangitis, this would be tender. It's totally non-tender, so there's no role for antibiotic. People get very nervous, but trust me, it's not infectious. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. And lastly, I'm leaving you with my niece because this is why we do what we do. She spent the first seven months of her life in the PICU. She has 100% Hirschsprungs, has a central line, has an ileostomy, and is thriving. And that's what we, why we do what we do. So thank you, everybody.